Well, good morning. Welcome to Wake Up in the Word. Thanks for joining me for just a few minutes this morning as we're going to again look at that clear conscience that empowers us to serve the Lord with our heart today. Grab a cup of coffee in the Word of God. Come join me. We are in 1 Peter chapter 3 looking forward to the promise and we're picking up with verse 19 this morning but to get there I want to once again emphasize verse 18 that we closed yesterday with. In 1 Peter 3 verse 18 it says, for Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Who is this? Keep in mind, remember the way this is laid out. Christ died for sins once for, once for all, the righteous, that's Jesus, for the unrighteous, that's us, to bring us to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, that's a capital S, which means the Holy Spirit. So then in verse 19, we're talking about the work of the Holy Spirit and our salvation. All right, so pick up in verse 19, saying the Holy Spirit, through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. He disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism. So Hang on here. Peter's jumping around, pulling all kinds of symbols in, in line here. He's saying the salvation God provided through the Ark of Noah symbolizes the salvation he was providing for you. A salvation through water, through a baptism, but not literally. Hang on. Remember, it's a symbol. He said this water, verse 21, symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Now, if you put a period right there, we'd be thinking, Water baptism must save us. That's not what he's saying. It's a symbol of how God saves us. And to make it plain so that you don't misunderstand, there's a dash where Peter clarifies what he's saying. He says of this baptism, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. So he's saying, wait a minute, we're not talking about the physical act of baptism that you went through when you became a Christian, to demonstrate that you've been saved, that you've received Jesus in your heart and in your life. You're now part of the family of God. That is an outward symbol. I say it's like a wedding ring. This wedding ring does not make me married, but it is an outward symbol of my inward commitment and vow to my wife to be married. whole different thing, the vow I made before her and before God. So the ring doesn't make me married. The commitment of my heart is what makes me married. Uh, the outward symbol of marriage, though, is here on my finger. Baptism is the same thing. It's an outward symbol of our inward commitment. So he mentions the word conscience in this passage again, though, to show us how important it is to recognize that our consciences can be blessed and stirred by the Holy Spirit. He says the pledge of a good conscience toward God. And it saves you, just in case you might also get confused and think, yes, see, it's my commitment to the Lord that saves me. It is my power because of my good conscience that's going to allow me to be saved. No, that's not what saves you. It's your response to what God has done, which is what? He says in the next sentence, it saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at, the, at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. So you've got to understand here the power of your spiritual baptism. The Bible says it saves you and it cleans your conscience. And that's versus what we're seeing even in the public sphere today, which is instead of a cleansed conscience, a seared conscience. Some of you are wondering as you Watch the world kind of going up in flames at times and everything from terrorism to rioting and looting and killing and destruction. And it seems like people just don't care. They don't even know right from wrong. And you might want to throw up your hands and say, what is wrong with people? Well, Paul actually tells us in his first letter to the preacher Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, where he says the Spirit, again, capital S, referring to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit clearly says that in latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars 
whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. Now, what is this idea of a conscience that's been seared? Well, it's the same kind of thing that might have happened to you if you, for example, were a smoker. Now, I have, I have not smoked, didn't want to smoke, uh, was raised in that generation where we first were discovering that smoking was bad for you, and I decided that wasn't a good thing for the temple of the Holy Spirit to do is ingest something that's going to kill me. So I never did smoke, but had friends that did and had parents and others that in an older generation that did, and many of them had that smoker's scar on their hand. If they're right-handed, it tended to be on their right hand. Left-handed, it tended to be on the left hand. If they just passed it back and forth, it was on both hands. What am I talking about? Right there on the finger where a cigarette or a cigar, whatever you were smoking, would begin to burn down. And when it's getting to the end, all of a sudden it was right there at your fingertip and you would get that little burn. The first few times you would get that burn, it would hurt. You would feel it. But then as time went on, you kept burning that same spot over and over and over again. Eventually, you built up scar tissue in that area, and many smokers could not even tell now that a cigarette or a cigar had reached to that part of their finger because they could no longer feel the pain. They could no longer feel the burn. That's what happens to your conscience as well. When you know something is evil, you know something is wrong, and you continue to do it over and over and over again, when the Holy Spirit's saying, I know, no, that is wrong, don't do it, but you ignore the Holy Spirit and you do what is evil anyhow, after a period of time, you have seared your conscience in that area and you don't even feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit any longer. But before long, if you do that in many areas of your life, you just decide to reject God altogether. You end up with that depraved mind that Paul talks about in Romans chapter 1. And by the end of Romans chapter 1, following that depravity, eventually God says, okay, I've tried long enough. I've spoken enough, and you're not listening. And he doesn't even call anymore. He just takes his hands off of you. And all of a sudden, you're living a life in which evil is good and good is evil. You feel much more pain and anguish over good people living good lives. They irritate you to death. It's like rubbing that salt that Jesus says we are, uh, the salt of the earth. It's like rubbing salt in an open wound. That's what irritates them. What irritates them now is to see you living a good and godly life. No wonder they hate you for it. Because now they are living a life in which evil has become their good. Everything is turned upside down. It is fashionable to disobey your parents, to break laws, to hate others, to loot, to rob, to steal, to live a lifestyle that literally breaks all Ten Commandments all at the same time and not even feel bad about it. So friends, what do you want? Do you want your conscience, your inner being to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit's leading and directing? Or do you want to be so numb to all of that that you feel no guilt at all? You can just go out and be happy and sin all you want to. Friends, if you take that route, then all you do is sear your conscience even more. But God is holding you responsible and will hold you responsible for all the pain, the agony, and the distress that you are calling. There is a righteous judge who will judge us all one day, and you're just piling it up for that day. Friends, I want to be sensitive to God's Holy Spirit, don't you? I want to know what's right and wrong. I want to absorb God's word and be committed to the right committed to doing good, being a person who folks can see in me the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which is love and joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, self-control, faithfulness, the things that really matter. And when we are those kind of people, we are not only a blessing, having received God's blessings ourselves, we are a blessing to others in our families, in our communities, and in our countries. So friends, make the choice today the positive choice to be a person of good conscience, a person with a clear conscience who can fight the good fight of faith and be a positive, peaceful, uh, godly impact on every single place in which God places you. I think that's a good objective to have today as we wake up in the Word. I'll see you again on Monday as we get back to Looking forward to the promise. We'll be in, in 1 Peter chapter 4. Tomorrow, of course, uh, we'll be uploading our message from First Baptist Church in Winsboro, South Carolina. Come join us for that message. If you can't be here in person, feel free to pick it up there on YouTube. A very special message tomorrow about something that is a, 
a day in history that we don't make a holiday, but it's what I call the turning point. The turning point. Would this nation be established or would it just collapse? There was a godly event that happened on that day that has made it possible for us to have the nation that we're in today with freedom of religion, at least as long as it lasts, and uh, a way to move forward in history with a different kind of government that had been unlike anything ever seen on the face of the earth. We'll look at that tomorrow in our message at Winsboro First Baptist. So come and join me either by video or in person, and I'll see you again Monday as we wake up in the Word.